Hello, everybody. Um, we just had our first class together, which was exciting, and we were all quiet and didn't say anything like you were all scared of me, so that's probably the way all the first classes go, I guess. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Frankenstein um, today, the first first little bit of it. Um, I have tried to mark every... I have a different uh, book version than, than you do. Yours looks like this. I've tried to mark all the pages in this that correlate with this, but please forgive me if I need to take a moment to find exactly where it is in your class. Um, in addition to that, I believe when you're watching this lecture, it will be, excuse me, it will be, okay, before some of the other discussions that, uh, some of the other lectures that you're going to watch in the next um, week or so on the romantic here and things like that. So I'll mention a couple of things that we'll discuss a little bit further um, in another lecture, but you can just sort of keep those in the back of your mind. You should have just taken the quiz on the letters section in the first two chapters of Frankenstein. I hope that you're enjoying it so far. I want to point out a few things to you. Um, one thing that we will talk about later is the idea of point of view and this being a frame narrative. Um, frame narrative is simply somebody telling a story within a story. Well, in this case we have the ship captain who's writing letters um, and that's one story but then within that story he gets Frankenstein's story and then eventually within that story we'll get the monster story too. So we have kind of several different layers here of a frame story. Um, it's a very sort of famous thing that, that people do. The Canterbury Tales is a frame story. Um, Heart of Darkness is a frame story, if you've ever read that or ever heard of that. Um, excuse me, I don't know why I'm so tired. Um, so uh, the first thing I want you to recognize is that, that it is a frame story. The letter section is part of this book, um, and it's an important part in a lot of ways. This would be one of those times where I'd really recommend that you take notes even though I'm just kind of talking off the cuff and don't have anything, the things that I'm saying are important and they're themes and quotations and ideas that will come up again later that um, I think help you understand the book. Normally if we were in class, I would um, have these quotations on these pages out and I would say one or two things and then kind of open it up for discussion in the class. So a lot of the class really is discussion based, um, but obviously we can't do that right now. Either way, if we were in class or like you're listening to this lecture right now, I would really recommend that you um, that you take a few uh, take a few notes. First thing I want to point out to you is in letter one, which of course I don't actually have this part marked down here. Um, it is on page. I think it's on page 16 for you. Yeah. Um, the paragraph in your book actually starts on page 15. The paragraph that starts, I'm already far north of London. Um, but towards the very end of that paragraph, he says, Yeah, again, I apologize for learning so much. He says, But supposing all these conjectures to be false, you cannot contest the inestimable benefit which I shall confer on all mankind to the last generation by discovering a passage near the pole to those countries to reach what at present so many months represent, or by ascertaining the secret of the magnet, which, if at all possible, can only be effected by an undertaking such as mine. This captain has a really noble reason for wanting to take this voyage. He's traveling far, far north. He's hoping, one, to discover the sort of scientific phenomenon of magnets, and two, he's trying to discover a quicker passage. He's trying to do something that will benefit mankind. It's interesting because that really parallels what Frankenstein is trying to do just a few chapters later. Um, the characters are set up as foils in a way. Um, foils is a literary term you should be familiar with if you aren't, but there are two characters that are similar for the point of comparison. Um, and oftentimes they... Um, are similar in some way, but then very opposite in others. Um, but they're there to kind of help us understand the other characters a little bit better. So the captain here is seeking noble purposes. So that's kind of the first thing I wanted you to 
to note and look at. Whew, goodness gracious me. Okay, the next thing is on page 21. This is letter 2. Um, in the paragraph that starts, I cannot describe to you my sensations. He says a little bit, uh, a little bit into that paragraph, but I shall kill no albatross. Therefore, do not be alarmed for my safety, or if I should come back to you as worn and woeful as the ancient mariner. We're going to read the ancient mariner at some point this year. We might have time to do it while we're reading Frankenstein. I'm truthfully not sure if you will or not. Um, but I, I do want us to try to read it. It's important to understand the idea of the Ancient Mariner, though, within the context of this book. The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner is written by Samuel Taylor Coolidge, and um, it is about a gentleman who is taking this ship um, out to um, this adventure, basically. They see an albatross, which is a really large bird. The albatross is supposed to be sort of a good symbol um, something from God that's blessing their trip. And rather than bless this albatross, the ancient mariner, the ship captain, shoots it. Um, and it leads through this horrific, horrific ordeal um, that's supernatural in a lot of ways. Um, but he's being punished. All of his shipmates die. He's cursed forever. He sees these monsters and ghosts. This ghost ship comes up. It's really kind of a creepy story, but it's all because he did this one thing to a creature that he really should not have done, um, and he's been punished because of that. So it's interesting here that from the get-go, um, the ship captain says he's going to be careful about the decisions he makes. He's going to be careful about the choices that he makes. He seems very sort of thoughtful, not necessarily emotional in his decision-making, um, but he seems to be pretty level-headed. One thing I hope you picked up throughout the letters is that he's longing for some sort of companion. And I don't mean a romantic companion. Instead, he's looking just for somebody to speak to, because a lot of the people don't speak English, and he um, just doesn't really have a friend, because he doesn't speak their language, and he's their ship captain, so it's difficult to communicate with them. Um... Flip over a few pages, page 30. This is just one of the great quotes from Frankenstein. Um, I agree with you, replied the stranger. We are unfashioned creatures, but half made up. If one wiser, better, dearer than ourselves, such as a friend ought to be, do not lend his aid to per, uh, perfectionate our weak and faulty natures. I once had a friend, the most noble of human creatures, and am entitled, therefore, to judge respecting friendship. You have hope in the world before you, and have no cause for despair. But I have lost everything, and be cannot begin life anew. We are unfashioned creatures, but half made up. Remember, one of the questions we're talking about this quarter is the idea of heroes and villains, right? But within the context of what does it mean to be human? We are unfashioned creatures, but half made up. What does he mean by that? That's a really cool quotation. Unfashioned would be what? You're not adorned, you're not um, you're not pretty, you're not you're not all sort of glorious yet. Unfashioned, we think of the word like unfashionable, somebody's not dressed very nicely. We are unfashioned creatures, but half made up. We're only halfway to where we're supposed to be. That might be kind of an accurate statement depending on your worldview and what you think. Are people really kind of like at half their potential? Are they half fashion creatures, not quite complete? And if so, what's that missing piece? What is that thing that, that we need to propel us further? For Frankenstein, the answer is probably science or somewhere in science. For you and me, though, it's an interesting, interesting question. Is it faith or religion? Is it education? Is it kindness? Is it love? What what exactly is it? Um, but it's a really great observation from Frankenstein, one of the first quotations we get from him. So, we get all this stuff, we find out that the stranger on the ship is Frankenstein, 
Okay. He um, ends up deciding to tell the ship captain everything that's going on, which brings us to chapter one. Okay. Um, we're going to start on uh, on. Let's actually start on. Let's start on page thirty-three. Um, the second paragraph in chapter one says, "As the circumstances of his marriage illustrate his character, I cannot refrain from relating them." Chapters one and two, excuse me, in chapter three a little bit, are really, really focused on the idea of character. Um, Mary Shelley's doing this cool thing and setting up all the characters for the whole book. So I want you to look at, and we'll talk a little bit about this in chapter two, how do the other characters compare with Frankenstein? His dad seems like a good guy. His marriage is going really, really well. Um, his father loved Bobert with the truest friendship. He's got good friendships. Um, so there's, there's some good relationships there. Um, towards the end of chapter 1, page 37, uh, the paragraph that starts, Everyone Loved Elizabeth, which might be on page thir at the bottom of page 36 in the book. Everyone loved Elizabeth. The passionate and almost reverential attachment with which all regarded her became while I shared it, my pride and my delight. Uh, a little bit later on, uh, everyone looked upon, I looked upon Elizabeth as mine, mine to protect, love, and cherish. All praises bestowed on her I received as made to a possession of my own. We called each other familiarly by the name of cousin. No word, no expression could body forth the kind of relation in which she stood to me. My more than sister, since till death she was to be mine only. This is a cool passage. One, we get a lot of great stuff about Elizabeth. Everybody loves Elizabeth, right? She's this great person. She is adopted into Frankenstein's family, so it's important to take a moment and kind of establish their relationship. He says here that she is his to protect, love, and cherish. She also is called his cousin. They're not really cousins. Technically, they're adopted siblings, but we'll see later in the book it's a romantic love to a romantic sort of relationship, which might be kind of weird, but it's not like they're related by blood, so their relationship can be a little bit complicated. The important thing here is that everybody loves Elizabeth. She's a good, kind person and creature. And then Mary Shelley ends with this sort of foreboding thing. My more than sister, since till death, she was to be mine only. So she's going to die. And we know that she's going to die. But now we have questions about how she's going to die and what their relationship's going to be like. The beginning of chapter two is where we get some more interesting characterization, but now we're starting to get a whole lot more about Frankenstein. Um, and right there at the beginning of chapter two, this is probably like page 38 in your book, um, about halfway through the first paragraph, it says, Elizabeth was of a calmer, more concentrated disposition, um, but with all my ardor, I was capable of more intense application and was more deeply spent with a thirst for knowledge. He's kind of driven um, and emotional. He, he describes it as an ardor, which is kind of like a passionate love, an intense application. Um, a little bit later on in that same paragraph, while my companion contemplated with a serious and satisfied spirit the magnificent appearance of things, I delighted in investigating their causes. He's establishing himself as a scientist. He's not just interested, though, in the beauty of the mouth. He's interested in why those things are, why, how science has fixed those things. We get some discussion of Henry Clerval, who is like his best friend, he's a big guy. And then on page 39, um, I want you to look at the paragraph that says, my temper was sometimes violent. My temper was sometimes violent and my passions vehement, but by some law in my temperature, they were turned not toward childish pursuits, but to an eager desire to learn and not to learn all things indiscriminately. His temper is sometimes violent. It's a very emotional thing. But it's not necessarily that they return to childish pursuits. He's not necessarily like a violent, angry person, but he has a violent personality in the way he pursues things and in the way he's passionate about things. It's a very emotional sort of feeling, right? If I came into you and said that I'm like violently passionate about teaching, um, it wouldn't be that I teach for some sort of intellectual purpose or because I like learning about literature or not even just because I like teaching. It would be kind of this ferocious, intense, 
pursuit of things. I want you to note there that from the beginning, Frankenstein is admitting to being pretty emotional. He's admitting to be a pretty passionate kind of person. That's going to come up in a, in a later lecture, this idea of, of um, emotion versus science. It's important to another concept we're going to talk about. And then lastly, on page 43, there was a strong effort of the spirit of good, but it was ineffectual. Destiny was too potent, and her immutable laws had decreed my utter and terrible destruction. This is really, really interesting. Um, the stuff that happens in Frankenstein is really Frankenstein's fault. He made the monster. He pursued the science. He did all these things that are going to lead him to be on this ship that he's talking about, uh, that the letters are about in the beginning. But here he says, um, destiny was too potent. Her immutable laws had decreed my ter utter and terrible destruction. Frankenstein hasn't taken any responsibility for what he's done. He's blaming destiny. He's blaming fate. I want you to take note of a couple of things while you're reading Frankenstein. One, look at Frankenstein as a character. What kind of person is he? What kind of scientist is he? What kind of brother is he? What kind of friend is he? Is he passionate? Is he logical? How does he handle situations? And then I also want you to think about how does he handle responsibility? I mean, if I made a mistake in class and, and you know, I accidentally gave you a zero or something on a project you turned in, I would have to take responsibility for that, and I would apologize to you and to your parents and go back and try to remedy things. So when Frankenstein has made a mistake, when he's starting to do these um, things that are kind of questionable, what's his reaction to those things? Does he take responsibility? Does he not take responsibility? Does he handle it well? Does he handle it poorly? I want you to be thinking about all that. And I want you to think about it again in the larger context of what does it mean to be human? I mean, is Frankenstein just kind of taking on normal human passion when we get really excited about a project? I don't know, maybe you're a, a writer or maybe you're an actor or maybe um, you like working on cars, but you probably all have had some sort of project or thing in your life that like you can't think about anything else but that. That's what the one thing you want to do. You just need to finish this. It's maybe really entertaining or it's just kind of driving you. That's kind of a pretty human emotion, I think, that we see in Frankenstein. But are all of his decisions and everything after that normal human decisions, or are they mistakes? I hope you enjoy it as you continue to read it. We'll have, I think, two more lectures in the next week or so going over some uh, the broader context, I guess, of Frankenstein. Uh, but I hope you enjoy it.